Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to present some of this work in the session, low traffic session. I'm going to talk about impact of transport on subsequent sea urchin and row enhancement, and I'll explain what we mean by that as we go through the talk. Okay, so this is Aquavitae. Aquavitae is a four year um, EU project. We're two years into the project now. The main aim of the project is to increase a sustainable production in terms of new species, new processes, and new products from low trophic uh, uh, value chains. You can see the five value chains that we focus on on the left hand side, and you can see all the case studies from within the project uh, as well in the, main, in the main picture. The one that we're focusing on, okay, it was the wrong way. The one that we're focusing on today is case study six, search and row enhancement. So this is the value chain if you just fish and sell sea urchins. Um, Normally they're taken from quite balanced ecosystems where there's enough food that the urchin has a row, good quality row. They're harvested and transported straight to market. People don't normally go near sea urchin barrens. Sea urchin barrens are where there's just an excessive amount of sea urchins and no food available to them. So the animals in these areas are very poor quality. They're no good to the fishermen because they don't have any row. Uh, and they're just left there. And they can maintain those sea urchin barren environments for a very, very long time, decades in fact. And in many areas around the world, that's, that's actually quite a problem. So what we're doing with row, uh, search and row enhancement is adding this step here. So we're then able to take searchings from the barrens, which are in poor condition. We either hold them in sea or land-based conditions for a limited period, eight to 10 weeks, or perhaps up to 12. We feed them uh, very specific formulated feeds, and that increases the amount and the quality of row and then they can be sold to market. So there's a twofold advantage there. You've got the obvious uh, economic advantage of um, selling the product at the end, but when you remove the sea urchins from this environment, that restores the ecosystem, and there's a lot of research on that process and how quickly that happens. And this can be done on a, obviously a whole range of different species. I'm gonna talk a bit about Strongylos introtus trabeciensis, the green sea urchin here, which is the one we find up in Norway. And this one is Paracentrotus libidus, which you would find here on the coast and along the coast of Spain and Portugal. Both species sold into the European market. Um, just a quick word about harvesting in Norway. Harvesting in most countries is not a problem for sea urchins, but it is a problem in the north of Norway. This is my colleague Tor getting ready to go and collect sea urchins. You can imagine it's not easy. We have dark in, the, in winter. So most countries around the world use diving. Um, we use free diving for our scientific collections, but as I said, the environmental conditions in Norway are pretty harsh. We're now looking at the efficiency of trap, um, trap, uh, trapping, and that's looking very promising. But when we harvest the Norway, we have very harsh environmental conditions to get the urchins from where we're harvesting to a possible enhancement site. Uh, so this is, this is the process that's fairly, we don't need to worry too much about this because the animals are going to go and they're going to be opened and they're going to be fed to the market. But when you look at this, harvesting and process, so harvest and transport to a facility where the urchin then has to be held alive for 10 to 12 weeks, they have to arrive at that facility in really good condition. And there's a few biological things that happen with urchins once you take them out of water. They've got the salomic fluid, they don't have any other circulatory system. They're relatively simple, but there's some uh, biochemical things going on in this um, salomic fluid that we think that we can measure, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, this is our, we've got quite set and, and very effective methods for short-term holding protocols when we're transporting from the harvesting site to the enhancement site. Uh, it's a matter of <clears throat> putting them in a, in a, in a temperature-controlled uh, bin, covering them with moist sacks, and then covering that sack to make sure they're not exposed. And that works really well for short term. So if it's a matter of hours, this works no problem. Uh, we then transport them to either a research facility or this is a new uh, pilot commercial scale facility in Stamaga in the north, sorry, in the south of Norway. So getting them from Tromsø down to the south of Norway here is, is, is one of the things that we're looking at when we talk about transport. <coughs> Most transports up till now, up to about 100 kilos have been done by air. Um, which is more similar to how they would be sent to transport uh, to, to the market. But if we're going to upscale that to you know, serious numbers in terms of commercial numbers like tons or half a ton, then that 
requires either road or sea transport systems. And that can be either nationally, in Norway, as I've said, we're actually collecting, believe it or not, in Tromsø and shipping them down to Stavanger, where the population is not very high, and then they've been um, enhanced here. There is also some commercial clients considering shipping them off overseas and then enhancing them closer to the market. So they reduce the risk of sending enhanced urchins too far. Uh, but what we want to know is what is the impact on this on subsequent enhancement when you transport an urchin that far. So we ran this trial, um, one of many that we've run, this is the one I'll present today, uh, it was in November 2020 through to January 21. Uh, we collected from a very well-known site, we've collected from many, many times before, held the urchins at two degrees in terms of room and seawater temperature. Uh, I should, that seems cold, but this is a cold water species, so they're, they're very used to that. Um, and we just held them in these static seawater tanks with aeration in a simple basket, very simple. Uh, for two simulated periods, seven days and 14 days, and two, two densities, four and eight kilos. And the eight kilo uh, we were assured by our commercial partners was the, that was the density they wanted to ship them commercially. Then after those, uh, after those simulated transports, they were then transferred to our uh, uh, research station where they're held in these individual compartments. We can monitor um, mortality and enhancement on the individual level uh, for 10 weeks. Uh, and we also had a control. So when we transferred these urchins to the system, we also went out and collected from the wild and did a no, uh, a no transport control. Fed the uh, Urchinomics sea urchin feed. It's a feed that's been developed over many, many years, actually by Nefema and licensed to Urchinomics. We know it's a very, very effective feed. Uh, and these are the results. So we have, um, this is the initial GI, this is the final GI, just so that we knew what would happen if we just left the urchins out in the water. Uh, zero days of transport, that's our control, and then seven days at four kilos, seven days at eight, 14 days at four, and 14 days at eight. In terms of the results, we see no significant difference between no transport and transport, which was a good sign to begin with. Uh, again, surprisingly, no significant difference, at least, between the four kilo and the eight kilo densities. And also no difference between, again, surprisingly, between holding them in seven days for 14 days in that, in that transport system. Those results, this is, sorry, I should have explained, this is in terms of the GI. So the GI is the somatic index, it's the amount of the wet weight that's made up of gonad. That's what we're looking at on the, on the left-hand axis there. I should have explained that, sorry. But when we move away from the GI increase and look at the transport mortality, then we start to see a difference. So zero days, um, the mortality was 2%, seven days on average 8.3, and 14 days up to 12.5. So obviously, even though we're not seeing differences in the amount of GI that they're putting on, we're certainly seeing differences in the amount of mortality. If you look at another species, this is Paracentrotus lividus. It's some work that we did with a commercial partner as part of the Innovel project. Um, uh, we went down together with Colin and set up an experiment at Alga Fres, uh, which is in Galicia in Spain in 2019. Uh, they had 18 shallow tanks, and again, we used the Eutronomics feed, so we know it works well on, well, we didn't know at that stage. Uh, uh, we know it's a very effective sea urchin uh, enhancement feed. Uh, the trial results for this first, so we went out actually with the fishermen and did the collection with them. Uh, what we found that was that we had significant harvest mortality. So we saw the collection that would have worked for Strongylocetrotus strabachiensis. It didn't work at all for Paracentrotus lividus. They, they were transported back in the boat uh, for about two hours and that was already too much. We saw this catastrophic uh, mortality in the first 14 days, 78% mortality. Um, it was difficult to tell with the GI. Uh, COVID actually kicked in around about here, so um, they did a great job at Algafres, but it was difficult to get GI results from that experiment. So we ran a second experiment, again, where we collected uh, Paracentrotus lividus, but this time we collected from, uh, well, Algafres collected from three different sites, and they were either, uh, they were right next to the hatchery, in fact, so virtually no transport, uh, three kilometres and 20 kilometres away. And then the results are given again in terms of uh, GI on this axis. Uh, and this is the December GI, the January GI, December, January, December, January. 
Uh, and these are for urchins fed macroalgae, and these are for urchins fed um, the urchinomics feed. So first of all, if you just compare urchins fed macroalgae versus uh, the artificial feed, obviously much higher uh, enhancement on the artificial feed, which we've seen many times before. Uh, but if you look at the sites, it's probably more interesting. So uh, these are the three sites color-coded. The green is closest to the hatchery, where they had the least amount of transport. Uh, and then blue and red progressively further. Uh, and you can see in terms of enhancement a big difference there um, across here with the, with the animals that were transported the least having the highest GI. So obviously this species is much more sensitive to transport uh, than our cool water species. Uh, uh, but the fact that we got them to feed at all was we were really pleased with. They're very slow at uptaking um, feed as well. So we we're very pleased with that. I mentioned the salomic fluid um, measuring stress and that sea urchin salomic fluid is something that we've started to look at in the femur. We have a student looking at this, this is uh, Astrid. Uh, very preliminary results, she's exposed urchins uh, to air exposure for 12 hours and then they've gone back in water and she's looked at the salomic fluid, tried to measure pH, oxygen, CO2, it's very, very difficult. So these are just results that came in at the end of the week, so we're going to analyse those and see whether or not it's possible uh, or not to create these operational welfare indicators. They've been used a lot for fish, Atlantic salmon. There's a lot of literature on using um, welfare indicators of animals to measure stress. Uh, hasn't been done for urchins before. We made some preliminary starts on these, but uh, you can look at physiological, uh, morphological behavior and health issues in terms of the individual or group mortality, group behavior. But we just lose the mic. I'll speak up. Group behaviour or, or uh, uh, growth itself, um, or environmental operational welfare indicators as well. So it's, it's sort of new, we're just starting to look at it, but we think that we can develop something that will give commercial clients a way of measuring just how stressed these urchins are uh, and what impact transport's having. And that can be done for more than one species, obviously. So conclusions, transport's having, a, we know it's having a negative impact, that's not too surprising on the GI, but uh, it's, well, it's actually not having so much impact on the GI and subsequent enhancement, but certainly increased variability in the GI and increased mortality as well. It's certainly species related, um, likely due to long-term post-transport stress. We asked the question, can we measure the stress and can we develop operational welfare indicators for sea urchins? That's, that's what we're trying to achieve uh, in the near term future. So I just want to thank my, uh, well, Aquavita, of course, for the funding, Blue Bio as well, and my uh, co, uh, well, Urchinomics for supplying the feed, and my co authors as well. Thanks. Thank you, Philip. Questions? Can I just pick up, Paul? Yeah, go. Okay. Yep. So, thanks for a nice presentation, Phil. You didn't, should I pick it up? Yeah, yeah. Pick it up. just a bit, yeah. I haven't done that in a while. Um, you didn't mention uh, the temperature of the transportation part of those uh, species uh, yeah. from Spain. Uh, you didn't mention it, right? So no, I didn't. It was amb ambient temperatures. So, um, Again, you know, much warmer in Spain than it was in Tromsø, obviously, which is pretty cold. Uh, we didn't measure it specifically. We'd, and in fact, again, that second trial even was done under COVID. So we had a really limited ability to go in and control. Algafres did an amazing job, but they were trying to deal with COVID at the same time. So we don't have that data. Uh, we only have the distance of the collection site from the hatchery. Yeah. Norway you can drop it to two degrees, yep. which is quite low. Yep. Uh, but probably that's lower than average temperature of the airlines. So it, could it be that the, the difference in temperature, I mean, would that explain uh, maybe a lower metabolic rate on, on those from Norway compared to those in Spain? Would that explain? Yeah, I think it's very difficult to compare them given that our experimental design was so, so different. But we did do another exper subsequent experiment on temperature um, in Norway, where we looked at two degrees and six degrees, and we didn't find a difference there. So it is a cool water species. Their lower range in the wild is around about two. So it's not, it's not a 
that's not a temperature that they don't experience. It's the lower limit, but it's certainly they would normally, they would experience it. But you're right, of course, I mean, lower, lower temperature, lower metabolites would have to have an impact, yeah. Although we didn't see that when we compared two and six degrees in the transport. Uh, if I didn't understand well, you, the transportation of the oceans, if they are like dry or moist, yep. no in, in water. No. So no, they're not in water at all. Uh, and in fact, we've found that that's, if, if they're treated very well, that's actually a better way to transport them, depending on how far you're transporting them. That works well for a matter of hours, I mean days, no, we've seen, we're starting to see when we do the longer term trials that no, day, uh, days is not good. Uh, and how many hours, we don't know yet, but that's, uh, that's why we would need to shift to the in-water transport if we're going if to, if, if it's not just from harvest to a local site, mm -hmm. then we need to do a much more substantial in-water transport. Yeah. 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 And then, before the sea urchins die in the experiment, did you see the loss of the spines and the... Like spots on the on the journeys. Uh, it's an interest, yeah, because because we experienced that, like when started, we started to see the the spines yeah. falling down. Well, we know they're going to die. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, they do some pretty unusual. They do this sort of spiral thing as well, where all the spines kind of spiral around the ship. They, yeah, um, we're working with a commercial uh, company, and and that, that the person there has spent a lot of time just looking. I mean, he spends hours just like looking in the tank. So he's coming up with some really interesting observations as you have. Uh, we certainly see yeah, spine loss, uh, you know, if they manage to, sometimes they lose their skin as well and that's, then they're going to die. And again, with those operational welfare, it's, it's identifying those things where if they happen, you know that the, the urchin's going to die. Yeah, yep. we have been collecting also that. Of the, it's okay, it'd be very interesting to have a look and compare. Yeah. Okay, thank you.